This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Profit power, strong earnings from iconic American companies fuel big gains on Wall Street, sending the NASDAQ past 6,000. Trade tensions, the Trump administration slaps tariffs on Canadian lumber, but will the housing market pay the price? And losing patience? Find out what happens when one of our reporters tries to go near a steel mill in China. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, April 25th. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. The Nasdaq powers past 6,000 for the first time ever. The Dow reclaims 21,000. The small cap Russell index hit a record. Wall Street once again seeing supersized gains for the second day in a row as some of the biggest companies in America crush earnings expectations. And all of this came on the same day that the U.S. threatened tariffs on Canadian lumber imports. That is a form of protectionism, something the market historically does not like. But today, it didn't seem to matter. The Dow Jones Industrial Average advanced 232 points to 20,996. The Nasdaq climbed 41 to a record, and the S&P 500 added 14. The Nasdaq's march to 6,000 comes more than 17 years after it first hit 5,000. Bertha Coombs takes a look at what powered the index, which is home to many of the world's biggest tech companies. The Nasdaq's historic milestone above 6,000 marks a 20% move in just eight months when the composite regained the 5,000 level for good. The Nasdaq is a market cap weighted index and more than half of the gains have been driven by the four tech giants that are now at record highs. They have the highest market cap valuation in the stock market. Apple, Amazon, Facebook and Microsoft. Apple, writing record sales of iPhones, has gained nearly 50% over the last eight months, far outperforming old guard tech peers that first led the NASDAQ to 5,000 years ago, like Intel, Cisco, Microsoft, and Yahoo. Ironically, tech stocks were hit hard following the election, but fundamentals have helped drive gains in recent months. The chip sector has worked off high inventories, and demand for new chip memory technology is driving growth and share gains. AMD and Micron have doubled over the last eight months. Apple suppliers NVIDIA and Skyworks have soared, and chip equipment maker LAM Research is at all-time highs. With tech giant Amazon on deck to report earnings this week, the Nasdaq may see more momentum on its record run. Bertha Coombs, Nightly Business Report at the Nasdaq. So what's next for the NASDAQ now that it has crossed that 6,000 mark? David Leibovitz is global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, joins us now with his thoughts. One of your, welcome, David. One of your thoughts is that the market, you think, will continue to sort of move higher, but in fits and starts. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a question to you sort of flippantly. What's next or what's more likely, NASDAQ 7,000 or NASDAQ 5,000? So I would say that broadly speaking, NASDAQ 7000 is, is probably more likely. You know, you're seeing these very large tech companies post very strong earnings. And I think it's important to remember that the broader economic environment is really unchanged uh, from where we've been over the past few years. And investors have been willing to reward these higher growth companies, these companies with the ability to grow earnings despite the economic backdrop. So I think the path of least resistance is probably up uh, rather than down. David, though, um, Bertha pointed out in her package that we just ran her report that, you know, the, the big cap tech is what has been powering this market. Are you worried that yep. maybe this advance is too narrow? You know, it's, it's a tough thing to say because these are market cap weighted indices. So when the biggest companies outperform, the index does very well. But what I would say is that my view is that this should, this should broaden out over the course of the year. You know, when I said this is a market which is going to move in fits and starts, it's going to entail some of these bigger companies outperforming for periods of time and then some of these smaller companies outperforming for periods of time. So it may be a little bit of both, but I do think that this market can continue to rise, primarily on the back of stronger fundamentals. You know, we're seeing earnings growth for the uh, third consecutive quarter, which should give support for stock prices to move higher. And if you say earnings growth, that would suggest that you would tilt more towards growth names rather than value names right now. That's absolutely correct. You know, I think that 
barring a significant change in U.S. government policy, barring a significant acceleration uh, in the U.S. economy, there's still more potential in these growth names. But if we see things like broad-based tax reform, or more importantly, we see the global economy, places like Europe and emerging markets continue to accelerate, I think the value names will catch a bit, bid and could power higher the way we saw them move uh, into the end of last year. We've talked to a lot of people, David, who say that, that, that given the run that we've had in the stock market, they find more value and more growth, for that matter, overseas. They point to Europe, they point to Japan and the like. Do you find those areas attractive or not? You know, the, the U.S. has had quite a run here, up over 250 percent from the market low in 2009. And we still think, as I mentioned earlier, there's further upside in U.S. equities on the back of, of a return in earnings growth. But at the same time, we can't ignore that both the economic and the corporate fundamentals are improving in places like Europe and emerging markets. Mm -hmm. You know, I would add on top of that that the U.S. dollar, which has been a headwind for uh, U.S.-based investors who are investing abroad, we believe is going to start cooling off. That could actually be more of a tailwind. So we like Europe, we like EM. We think Japan is really a play on the currency, so we're sticking towards Europe and EM rather than tilting towards the Japanese equity market. David, thanks so much. Always great to see you. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. David Leibovitz is with J.P. Morgan Asset Management. And the markets were driven in large part by upbeat earnings reports from five Dow components. But much of the gains were driven by two stocks in particular. Caterpillar crushed earnings estimates and raised its forecast for the year. McDonald's also reported better than expected results, making these two names the top performers on the blue chip index. Dominic Chu has more. Make it two days in a row. Big gains for the Dow repeated themselves on Tuesday, thanks in large part to a slate of positive earnings reports. The bulk of the upside move in the large cap blue chip index came from just two stocks. First, it was the biggest construction equipment maker of them all. Think bulldozers, backhoes and dump trucks. Caterpillar stock surged in trading after it reported better than expected sales and profits and also boosted its full year profit forecast as well, thanks in part to improving markets in areas like energy and transportation. So who's in the mood for a Big Mac and some fries? Mickey D's, the Golden Arches, whatever you want to call it, McDonald's stock was also at the top of the list of upside Dow performers. That's after the fast food giant top profit and sales expectations as well, and reported better sales at established restaurants thanks to things like lower costs, all day breakfast, and Big Macs that come in different sizes. McDonald's stock, by the way, hit a new record high. And we'll round things out with a check on shares of the company, formerly known as Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, or 3M as it's known today. The maker of everything from post-it notes to automotive filters also posted better than expected sales and profits thanks to strength in areas like industrial, healthcare, and the energy businesses. 3M shares also hit a record high today. Thanks to today's gains, the Dow is just about a percent away from setting its own record high. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Fellow Dow component DuPont also reported better than expected results, helped by sales from its agricultural unit, which accounts for half the company's revenue. DuPont, it's merging, of course, with Dow Chemical, said it expects the deal to close in August. The stock gained about 3.5% in trading today. But Dow component Coke missed earnings estimates and reported a double-digit percentage drop in quarterly profit. The company, which is battling a slump in soda sales, plans to eliminate 1,200 jobs. But Coke's incoming CEO sees a path back to growth. Second quarter will reflect um, the completion of our Chinese bottling transaction on the 1st of April as well. So that'll change the numbers. So 17 will continue messy. It'll get cleaner into 18 and 19. And you'll start to see uh, the robust growth coming through uh, for the new future smaller company. Shares of Coke fell even as the broader market rallied today. Trade tensions are rising and the country we're quarreling with now is brought to you by the letter C. But it's not the C country you might think it is. It's Canada, America's second largest trading partner after that other C country, China. The Trump administration plans to impose a tariff on softwood lumber imported from our northern neighbor. The dispute is not new, and the U.S. timber industry has long complained that Canada subsidizes its lumber industry. Canada objected to the decision, which comes as the two countries get ready to renegotiate the North America Free Trade Agreement, which, of course, the president has criticized. 
Much of the lumber that's imported into the U.S. is used to build homes. Concerns that the tariff will raise costs for home builders sent shares of those stock lower in trading today, including Pulte Group, which reported weak quarterly results. Diana Olick takes a look at the potential ripple through the housing market. It takes a lot of lumber to build a home, and the price of that lumber is going up. The Trump administration's new duty on Canadian lumber has already increased lumber cost for builders, and that will be passed on to buyers. Above all, the losers in the softwood lumber dispute are middle-class Americans who want to buy an affordable home. Fully one-third of lumber used in the U.S. last year was imported, the vast majority from Canada. Lumber makes up 10 to 15 percent of the construction cost of the average home. That goes to framing, molding, flooring. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross said he does not expect costs for lumber to rise much. We do not think that the price of lumber will go up by anything like the 20 percent, but there may be some small increase uh, in the price of lumber for the house. Lumber prices were already up 22 percent so far this year just from the uncertainty surrounding a possible tariff. Estimates are that increased lumber costs will add about $1,200 to the sale price of a newly built home. This at a time when builders are already struggling with a labor shortage. You're tight on land, you're tight on labor, your material costs are going up. Do you expect things to get better or worse under the Trump administration? Well, I don't see how uh, things are going to get better, to be honest with you. We spoke to Gene Myers, a Denver home builder, earlier this month. He said he could be building far more homes if his costs were lower. Most of the materials that we use are global commodities. And so anything that affects in the free flow of those commodities across borders, I think, will have a price effect. The U.S. housing market is already seeing a severe shortage of both new and existing homes for sale. That alone is pushing prices higher far faster than incomes. Builders are bracing for even more cost increases if the Trump administration institutes a border adjustment tax. Other building products like cement and drywall are also imported to the U.S. If they fall under any new border tax, it will increase construction costs even further, which will limit the supply of homes for sale even more. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. A separate report from the Commerce Department today shows that new home sales climbed to an eighth-month high in March, making it the third straight month of gains. Three months into the year, sales are running 10 percent higher than in 2016. Inventories are low, demand is high, and the sales gains come despite rising prices. Still ahead, watch what happens when one of our reporters tries to go inside a Chinese steel mill. New details tonight on what the president may outline on taxes tomorrow. The Wall Street Journal reports that the proposal will include cutting the top tax rate on owner-operated businesses to 15 percent. He's also called for a 15 percent top corporate tax rate. The blueprint will reportedly include a tax break for child care expenses, a priority of the president's daughter, Ivanka. President Trump has repeatedly criticized China for dumping cheap steel into U.S. markets. He's vowed to put an end to it in order to protect American companies. Beijing says it will cut production, but so far that hasn't happened. Eunice Yoon reports tonight from Longfang, China. China's excess steel is raising tensions overseas. It's also raising sensitivities back home. We came to the town of Longfang, two hours from Beijing, in a northern province which makes more steel than the entire United States. Washington has accused China of flooding global markets with cheap steel. 
Beijing has repeatedly issued plans to reduce production, but those efforts haven't gone far enough. Analysts estimate that operating capacity in China actually increased last year as local officials, investors and banks keep mills open so workers can stay employed. Behind me is the local steel mill. The townspeople say that the authorities here have repeatedly over years instructed the steel mill to scale back capacity. But last year officials found that it expanded capacity. And that's a problem here in China. It quickly became a problem for us too. No, 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 don't. We've only been to the steel mill for a couple of minutes, but the police have already stopped us from filming. They've blocked us and aren't letting us leave. And I think it just really goes to show how sensitive the issue of steel and excess capacity has become in China. Factories producing steel or steel-related products here are struggling to find new places to sell, both in China and abroad. We've put greater effort in our sales to match the production, this businessman says. The government has closed some factories, but production levels haven't dropped off. Washington is losing patience. U.S. President Donald Trump has vowed to take tougher action against cheap imported steel, which means China's. Businessmen here, though, doubt Trump can force Beijing's hand. Reducing capacity is a gradual process, he says. The government has its own proper and reasonable agenda to cut capacity at its own pace. But it doesn't want the cameras to show just how slow that pace is. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Yunus Yoon in Longfeng, China. Eli Lilly cuts its outlook, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The drug maker lowered its adjusted profit forecast for the year, saying severance costs would hurt its results. But for the latest quarter, the company reported earnings and revenue ahead of expectations. The company's CEO says Lilly's strategy is working. We grew the total business 7% in Q1, 9% uh, for the pharma business, and 10 points of, of the nine, so more than all of it was attributed to our new products. The strategy's playing out, we're executing well, and it was a good, uh, solid operating quarter for the company. Well, despite that, Eli Lilly shares fell more than 2% to 81.20. IBM raised its quarterly dividend, 10 cents, to $1.50 a share. The company also signed a collaboration agreement with the Swiss engineering company ABB to create and develop new industrial products. IBM shares fell 36 cents to 160.39. Rite Aid said the ongoing merger process with Walgreens negatively impacted its quarterlies. Still, the drugstore chain managed to top earnings and revenue estimates and said it's working with the Federal Trade Commission to wrap up its merger with Walgreens by midsummer. Shares of Rite Aid popped 6% to $3.97. Lockheed Martin posted a rise in sales but missed estimates due to charges that the company booked related to its foreign contracts. But it did raise its revenue forecast for the year. As for profit, the company beat expectations but said it was lowering its outlook for 2017. The shares were off 2 percent to 270.02. The mining company, company Freeport McMoran turned a profit and reported higher sales, but the results fell short of estimates. The company also said it will resume operations at its Indonesia mine for at least six months while it works with that country's government to negotiate a new agreement. Freeport shares surged 7 percent to $13.10. AT&T posted lower than expected revenue, citing weak equipment sales. Earnings met estimates, and the telecom giant noted that postpaid phone churn was the lowest it's ever been during a first quarter. Shares initially rose in after hours, but finished the regular session down marginally to $39.94. And Chipotle reported profit and revenue topping expectations as the burrito chain benefited from an increase in customer traffic and spending. Same store sales also scratched out a gain that beat the street targets. Shares of Chipotle initially rose in extended hours trading and also ended the regular day up just a fraction to 471.76. What if you could steer a self-driving car with sound waves? It may not be that far-fetched. A team from the University of Michigan found that sensors in things like self-driving cars could be vulnerable to hacking by sound waves. Andrea Day reports. Keep your eye on the toy car. That sound just made it change directions. Watch again. Instead of the user controlling the car, I was controlling the car with the sound waves. It's the first time this team from the University of Michigan has publicly demoed their latest research, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. 
Here's how it works. There's a tiny chip inside your smartphone called an accelerometer. That sensor keeps the image on your screen displayed upright. Certain apps use it to work, like the app the team's using right here to drive the remote control car. Because we can deliver sound waves to control what the phone thinks its orientation is, we can then control that vehicle. They started researching after some colleagues in Korea found a way to make drones fall out of the sky using sound waves. Accelerometers are used in drones to keep the flight stable. The propellers would spin in a weird fashion and just drop. And we thought, well, that's kind of cool, but what if you could just take it and fly away? The difference between causing havoc and, and taking over the control of the system. And that led to controlling the toy car. There are billions of accelerometers in use right now, controlling everything from medical devices to the airbags in your car. And the role is growing. My fear would be that someday, five, ten years from now, uh, if the manufacturers haven't taken these risks into account, they're going to be systems that might suddenly all fail across the entire globe simultaneously. His big concern? Self-driving cars. They're inevitable and they're going to be driving based on sensors, flying uh, just on instruments. This is where those sensor readings are going to be so much more important because we need them to be trustworthy. And that's why they were quick to share their findings with Homeland Security. Because this is not just one company, these are thousands of companies. I would not be surprised if, if the underworld has already discovered this. Um, we think the best way to solve these problems are doing it out in the open. The team has already figured out a way to control sensors in smartphones and fitness trackers. They're now checking out more critical systems like pacemakers and aviation. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Andrea Day. Next, follow the Golden Brick Road. We take you to a street with more of America's priciest houses than any other. Labor tensions are rising in Hollywood, where writers could be headed for the first writer's strike in a decade. Julia Borston takes a look at where the negotiations stand. Talks resumed today between the Writers Guild of America and the Alliance of Hollywood Studios. Last night, the Writers Guild voting to authorize a strike by a surprisingly large margin, 96 percent. The strike would start May 1st if the two sides can't reach a compromise. About two weeks ago, the parties were $350 million apart. The writers wanted a $535 million package. The studios were looking at something more like 180. Uh, the parties have moved since then. And what's interesting is that when you do a sort of point by point, what are the issues, look at, at where they are. Uh, they have come on a number of issues significantly closer. But it's unclear if the two sides will be able to make a deal in the next week. Writers arguing that despite a surge in the number of TV shows, salaries have decreased an average of 23 percent over the last two years. Action. That's due to the trend of shorter TV seasons, the fact that basic cable shows pay less than broadcast TV, and while shows on Netflix may pay as much up front as broadcast shows, they pay lower residuals or royalties over time than traditional TV shows do. One effect of a strike, if there is one, is that viewers would be driven off of broadcast platforms and uh, further in the direction of Netflix. I mean, the sell is very obvious from the Netflix perspective. It's, did you miss... Breaking Bad, now's your time to discover it. Did you drop Breaking Bad after two seasons? Now's your time to pick it up again. They have a depth of library content uh, that's available on demand, obviously, at one streaming price per month that no one else has. It's not just the Hollywood studios watching these negotiations, but the whole Los Angeles economy. According to the Milken Institute, the last strike a decade ago, which lasted 100 days, cost the California economy $2.1 billion in lost output and nearly 38,000 jobs. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles.
And finally tonight, we talk a lot about rising home prices across the country, but you'll never believe what some houses are selling for on a single street in California. Robert Frank takes us there. Well, it's a gold rush in the Platinum Triangle. Prices and sales of mega homes in LA's richest neighborhoods, Beverly Hills, Homeby Hills, and Bel Air, are soaring. Demand from young tech tycoons, Middle East royals, and rich Europeans led to hundreds of sales, over $10 million over the past two years, a record. The epicenter of the boom is a section of Hillcrest Road in Beverly Hills called Billionaire's Row, now believed to be the most expensive street in America. And the views are considered among the best in all of Los Angeles. A mansion sold for $70 million to the founder of Minecraft. Teardowns are going for at least $50 million. And a tiny plot of land less than a quarter of an acre sold for $32 million. Now the biggest sale of them all has come onto the market. A newly built mansion listed for $100 million. It's called Opus. It's over 20,000 square feet. It comes with two pools an infinity pool overlooking all of Los Angeles with the other downstairs with a glass waterfall. It's got a champagne vault with 170 bottles of Cristal. They all come with a house along with a gold Lamborghini and a gold Rolls Royce. Builder Niall Niami said the $100 million price tag is actually reasonable given recent sales on Hillcrest. If you take the, the comps of everything that's sold, even the house next door that sold for $70 million two years ago, I think that this house is priced well at 100 Now, Miami is also building an even bigger house in nearby Bel Air, priced at $500 million, which means that Hillcrest may not hold its richest title for very long. For a nightly business report, I'm Robert Frank. Here's another look at the rally on Wall Street. The Dow advanced 232 points, the Nasdaq climbed past 6,000, and the S&P 500 added 14. That'll do it for Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And thanks from me as well. I'm Tyler Matheson. See you right back here tomorrow night.